Good evening. It was January 1992 in Akron, Ohio, when I met the man of my dreams. He was tall, dark chocolate, I'm, I mean dark chocolate, <laughs> and handsome to me. He was a Mississippi boy. He had a southern swag. It was always, yes ma'am, no ma'am. He always opened the door. Just a sweetheart. We loved the same things. We loved the same music. We had the same Christian values. We just meshed, you know? Oh, I forgot to mention, he weighed 460 pounds. 460 pounds. Yes, the man of my dreams was morbidly obese. I tell you that fact because that is the one characteristic that I was judged for for being with him. You see, the love of my life is a world-renowned laparoscopic surgeon. His name is Dr. James Rosser, and everybody calls him Butch. <laughs> and people thought that I was with him because he was a surgeon. They called me a gold digger. They said I was an opportunist, because how could someone find a 460-pound man attractive? But I did. I had the ability to look past what everybody else saw. In spite of the naysayers, Butch and I were married. December 9th, 1995, in front of 300 witnesses. It was a beautiful day. Little did I know that that was the beginning of my journey in living and loving someone with this disease called morbid obesity. Most of the time, the emphasis is put on the person that carries the weight. Little emphasis is ever put on the loved ones, the supporters, the wives, the kids. But I often wonder, why is that? But today, I want to shed some light. They have a song to sing, and I want you to hear their song. It's no secret that there is an obesity epidemic in this country. Nearly one-third of Americans are obese, which is about 76.8 million people. But did you know that up to 11 million people are morbidly obese? And I'm defining morbid obesity as weighing 100 pounds or more over your ideal weight, or having a BMI, a body mass index of 40 or, or greater. So just think about that, 11 million people. So just take one of those precious souls and think about them for a minute, just one. They have girlfriends, boyfriends, partners, spouses, they have in-laws, children, grandchildren. Does anybody ever think about them? The sphere of impact is great. So yeah, it might be 11 million people who actually carry the weight, but what about the people who carry the weight of anxiety on their shoulders every day? What about them? Does anybody ever think about them? These people are suffering silently. I know, because I was one of them. Ways that I suffer silently are great. Um, I always felt like I had to be Butch's protector. I remember when we would travel and get on airplanes, I would always try to walk in front of them to take on the people's stares and gawks and laughter. Because I felt like, okay, if they could just give it to me and not give it to my husband, because I love them so much. Or there were times when we would go out to a restaurant. I would always go two days before if I had made a reservation to make sure and check that the seating was proper for him. Because I didn't want him to get there and he wouldn't be able to sit in the seats. And what I mean by proper, I mean there were no arms on the seats. I was his protector. And yes, there was times when I was very lonely. Because people are so cruel to those who are morbidly obese, a lot of times Bush just wanted to stay at home. 
He didn't want to go out. We, I often like to go out to games or plays or concerts, and he was a little gun shy about doing that because of the seating. So because I loved him so much, I didn't go. I stayed at home with him. Or I went with my friends, and I felt sad because I wanted to be with him. So I felt guilty for being there. I felt lonely. And yes, I have to admit, I was angry. I was angry. Anytime I would see him eat something that he shouldn't eat, I would think to myself, don't you know that every time when the phone rings, I think somebody's calling to tell me that you died, that you had a heart attack? Or do you realize that in the middle of the night at times, I, I would nudge you, wake you up, to see if you're still breathing because he, he dealt with sleep apnea? Do you know how anxious that makes me? But he didn't know that because I couldn't tell him. I always felt like the world was already beating him up. So why would I tell him that? So I kept my feelings inside. So as you see, I had conflicting feelings. I loved him, I wanted to support him, I wanted to protect him, but I was also lonely and angry at the same time. So where do I go for support? I needed help. There was nothing. I showed you the statistics. You mean to tell me there's nobody else out here that feels the same way that I do? I know that's not true. I know that's not true, so where are they at? Where's the support groups for people like me? I looked on the internet. I looked for books. I didn't see anything. I remember going to an Overeaters Anonymous meeting just looking for something. But again, it was more focused on the person, not so much me, the supporter, or the loved one. So in my quest for self-help and self-care, I just went to a regular counselor. And I told him all my feelings. I told her all my feelings. And the one thing that I remember that she told me that I'll never forget, she said, Dana, you are living with morbid obesity without carrying the weight. Do you realize you're doing that? And I thought to myself, no, I, I had no idea I was doing that. You are become, becoming reclusive. You are not doing the things that you should be doing. And it just, it was like a light bulb that went off on me. It's like I have to be whole to be able to take care of my loved one. So you're probably asking, okay, Dana, well, what can I do? What can I do to help this issue? First of all, I am begging you to please have more compassion and empathy for those people that don't look like you, for those people that are different, for those people who are morbidly obese. They're doing the best they can on an everyday basis. And they have people, supporters, loved ones, who are holding them up at home. So the next time you want to judge, think about me. Think about children, our children. Think about love, their loved ones. Don't do it. Everybody has something, you know? Everybody has something, don't judge. And for supporters, start a support group within your community. Get like-minded people in your community to talk about these issues. I know that they're feeling it. You can't tell me that they're not feeling it. And if you can't start in the community, start it in your own home. I remember gathering up um, three or four family members and sitting and talking. Butch was not there, and we just talked about our feelings. We talked about how we could support each other, and more importantly, how we could support him. The other thing is self-care. You're a supporter. You have to be able to take care of yourself, and that means getting real with your, real, with the, with your feelings. You have to get real with your feelings, whether that's anger, embarrassment, shame, sadness, anxiety, whatever it is. And the other piece of advice I would give you is don't wait. If you need to have the, your talk with your loved one, you gotta have it. As hard as that is, you have to have it, but you gotta lead with love, always leading with love. So you're probably wondering, well, where's your husband now? How is he doing? Well, in 2001, he had gastric bypass surgery. And ironically, 
his patient is the one who encouraged him <laughs> to get the surgery. She had the surgery and she said, listen, we need you here on this earth to continue to save lives. Please do something about your weight. And she was the one that encouraged him to do it. And so it's not an end-all, be-all, and everybody, you know, doesn't have to have the surgery. It's a picture of him now. There was a picture of him with Dr. Phil Shower before his surgery. And so now he's lost 160 pounds, I'm, I'm happy to report. And we just celebrated 20 years of marriage, uh, December 9th of last year. <laughs> I love him, and I just wanted you just to see just a glimpse of supporters. I hope this changed your mind in some way. If you don't mind, I would love for you to meet the love of my life, my chocolate drop, <laughs> Dr. James Butcherosser. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am just, I'm just so happy that my wife had the courage to share our story. Darling, I'm so proud of you. As we've shared this story around the country, it's amazing how it has had and meant so many things to so many different people. But I want you all to know tonight that ours is a simple love story. A love story that is really still being written. Mm -hmm. This presentation was not meant to be a monument to some great accomplishment. It really wasn't meant to be or share a picture of a relationship that is absolutely one of perfection, that we still, God is still having work for us to do. But what it is truly meant to do is to inspire a movement, a movement that will eradicate ignorance and prejudice against those who suffer from morbid obesity, and to give a voice and support to those who would dare to love someone like me, stricken with the disease. I want to thank you, darling, for really expanding my sense of survival beyond myself. And thank you for standing with me through thick and thin. Welcome. All right. All right. Good job.